Hello, 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 and welcome back to another episode of Kerbal Space Programming. Kevin here, and I wanted to switch things up a little bit today. Uh, I have some note cards that we're going to go through. I'm going to talk to you in the person. Um, we're also going to have uh, some some footage, some game footage that goes up alongside this, but I wanted to kind of step back because we went through in the last episode and we tried to uh, use genetic algorithms to solve a PID controller for us, and we were very excited, and it didn't do anything. Like we saw no market improvement at all. Um, you can tease out some statistical trends, but even then, I think you can pretty well ignore them. Um, I want to talk a little bit about why that didn't work and how we can go about fixing it going forward. Because what we're going to do is we're basically not going to use genetic algorithms, but we do end up with a good PID controller by the end of this video, I absolutely promise. So this is basically what we are trying to solve, this problem, right? There is some error over time. And actually, I think this is more altitude over time because we start off below. But our error is prob probably starts off. Oh, man, what direction are we in? Yes, our error starts off very large. It's because the reverse thing. Our error starts off um, up here and then we'll drip down and stuff. Um, what we're So we have some sort of altitude that our ship is moving at and we have some sort of desired altitude and we're just tracking the difference over time. And so this is basically, we have some sort of error and the idea of this controller is to minimize that error. And over and this is an example where basically it's constantly gonna oscillate up and down around the target value. Um, but what we're trying to do and what the genetic algorithm was trying to do is it basically tracked the, the height above and below this curve, uh, the height of the curve above and below the line as often as it could and it summed all of that up and then gave something a score based on how small that was so ideally if something got up to this line and then stayed flat that'd be a perfect score you know the fastest that you can get to that line and then the mo the closest you stick there good good on you that's what we're trying to optimize and that's what really we're trying to tune for so why didn't this work well we can do some hand waving and say you know it's possible that there's just not enough that because we had it running for a short enough period of time that there wasn't enough time for the good solutions to really shine above the not so good solutions. And maybe there's too much noise and the physics engine doesn't always calculate and blah, 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 blah. And so things aren't running with equal blah. There, there are some really stupid uh, decisions that we made um, in the design of this. And I've got them listed here. So one TWR, which is the thrust to weight ratio. PID controllers are linear response systems. That means for a given input, there is a output. There is time stuff with the integral and derivative term. But with our rocket, as we burn up fuel, uh, thrusting, setting our throttle to 0.5 is going to do something different. This is not. This is a. This is a sensitive to sensitive to conditions, and we didn't account for that at all. We just said it'll be fine. The, 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 just just you control the throttle and you watch the the velocity. I don't care what your mass is. I don't care what your thrust to weight ratio is. What we could do instead, and what I have done, is have the big controller adjust the desired thrust to weight ratio and then convert that to throttle. So if we say our available thrust to weight ratio is five, and you control whatever the desired thrust to weight ratio is, and then we'll say, all right, you said three, we'll say, all right, so the throttle is three fifths, and then we'll just control it that way. Now, in theory, um, the integral term of a big controller should account for this over time, um, because if we, you know, if, if we get things perfect, and all of a sudden we start to drift up because we weigh less and so we can thrust we can thrust more, the integral term should go, hey, you're overshooting. We, I'm going to exert some downward pressure on the throttle. But why why do we have to, if, if we can already account for that, there's no reason to make the integral, that part of the integral's job. The integral's already work, working on stability for the rest of the system. Second thing that we did, constraints. Oh man, yeah, I got to make sure to put these close because the light is a little too bright. It's washing stuff out. Constraints, um, stupid thing. <laughs> the tuning values for a PID controller don't have to be between zero and one. They can be any number. Um, I, I knew that at one point. Um, we did only test values between zero and one. Now, it's entirely possible that um, because, because we were dealing with the throttle output value between zero and one, that was very reasonable. But it's entirely possible that it wasn't. We just didn't test a whole possible range of solutions. We didn't let them compete. So, hmm. Um, and then third, we were trying to genetic algorithm all of the things. Um, now, genetic algorithms are a really cool solution. They're, they're, it's exciting to see kind of emergent 
fancy behavior that just appears out of seemingly nowhere, but it doesn't always, it's not always the best solution. And especially in cases where there are means of tuning things, then maybe try those first, or at least apply some domain knowledge um, to fixing those. So I want to talk real quick just to refresh on what, how the terms of the PID controller. So you have, you have P, right? That's your proportional term. And as we have error, um, you're going to have your proportional term proportional to the amount of error. So while we have a positive error, we're going to go, oh gosh, there's a lot of error. I'm going to throttle up. Again, this is altitude and not error. This is flipped the wrong way. Anyway, um, if we have negative error, then theoretically the proportional control will go to a negative value. It'd be, you know, decelerate, re reverse thrusters. Um, of course, we don't have the ability to do that, but it would if it could. Um, that's the proportional term. That one's fairly simple, right? You, you take the input value, you multiply it by something, and that's your output value. The integral term is wonderful for stability, though. This is basically, it's going to track over time this curve, and it's going to track all of the, the total amount of error. So sometimes we have negative error, sometimes we have positive error, sometimes we have negative error, sometimes, and what it's going to detect here is, I suppose I drew the error in the wrong place, is it may detect like over time, yeah, we're spending a little too much time in the negative error, so roughly point us, point us upward, or maybe we're spending too much time in the positive error, so pull us downward. Now, then there is the derivative term, the derivative term takes the slope at any point. So as we're looking at the error, we get up to here, and then we end up with the, ah, geez. We end up with a line right there, right? And as we go here, then we end up with a line right there. And that slope is what gets put on here. What the derivative term does is it dampens what the other two parts of the controller want to do if the rate of error is changing very quickly. Um, so this theoretically can help a little bit. So... What we want to do is avoid all of this crazy oscillation that we saw basically through the entirety of the last episode. And so what we're turning to now is the Ziegler-Nichols method. Now, the Ziegler-Nichols method is a tuning method that promises, I don't know, I, don't, I shouldn't say promises, but it at least reports to offer quarter amplitude decay. And I've drawn this very carefully. So you'll notice this goes up four pre-marked things. The next peak goes up one or one quarter of the peak before. This is what it is promising to do for us when there is a change in the input, it's gonna go ahead and it's gonna say, all right, we will have some oscillation initially, but it is going to dampen itself very, very, very quickly. And that is basically what it is promising to do for us. So how do how does it go about doing this? Well, the Ziegler-Nichols method says, turn off your integral and derivative tuning values, because those are crazy. And all we're gonna do is we're gonna tune that proportion of value. And what they want is a stable, oscillation and that's pretty similar to basically what we had here on one of the first one of the first cards basically it just goes up and down up and down very consistently so we're going to go ahead and we're going to try that in ksp all right so you start off with a very low threshold and i've gone ahead and i've turned on uh the debug menu and given myself infinite fuel just because I didn't, I didn't want to worry about this thing running out of fuel. I just said, we're just going to let this test run until whatever. We're going to start off with some low values, and we're going to tune it up and up and up until we get a value that starts to make sense. Now, because we are fighting gravity, um, whereas if you're tuning, I guess, a regular PID controller, you, you're dealing with, in theory, like a zero-sum situation. With the low, <laughs> with the low P value, we're going to end up with something like this. We may go like, oh, we're supposed to be out there. All right, I'll go up. Oh, I don't have enough thrust. And then we, yeah, we, we die off. That is, a, that is too low, right? So eventually we get to something that almost looks like what we, what, what we eventually want. It's sort of like quarter amplitude decay. We get to something where it overshoots maybe by a little bit, but then it flattens out really, really, really quickly. Now that may be a great ideal solution, but we're not looking for that right now. We're looking for this ultimate gain that provides that constant oscilla oscillation. This is weird because we've been trying to fix that exact problem, and now they're telling us, find exactly that number. Just adjust this KP value until you manage to get it to wobble a lot and consistently. We're trying to make it wobble. So, all right. Now, if we overshoot, we're going to end up with something like this where basically it'll it'll undershoot and then all of a sudden it will just go crazier and crazier and crazier and all sorts of out of control. Um, I, I actually had a difficult time actually getting to a value like this um, just because 
I, I, I don't know. I think there's, I think there's some damn thing. It could just be that there's just not enough time for us to go crazy. But I did find that there was a KP value. I think it was, a, I think it was like five or six. Um, this is for thrust to weight ratio. That gave us something like this. So we get two things. We have the value that we set, that is the KU value, uh, the 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 ultimate gain, or our, our, what we've said is the KP value in our PID control. And then what it also needs is the time period between those oscillations. So we can measure peak to peak. Although in this, in my case, I ended up measuring um, uh, crossovers because it just ended up being being a little bit easier. But of course, there is a problem with this, and that is, how do we actually measure that? If you look at the launch that is happening right now, thank you, post-editing Kevin, um, you'll notice that there is a, uh, it's oscillating pretty darn quickly. So how do we know if it's oscillating consistently? How do we know if it's, if it's, if it's starting to get smaller or if it's getting bigger? How do we know if the time periods are consistent? Well, the time periods we're not going to worry too much about. But here's what I came up with. We could theoretically measure every single single peak and trough and then track their variance and try and minimize that that seemed way too complicated to me so here's what i ended up doing so i basically said we're going to measure we're going to measure a couple things we're going to choose an arbitrary point relatively soon after we change so we've been throttling up at full throttle and then we say hover immediately so we go ahead and i say here's here's some cutoff after we've been throttling and i think i said it's just like five or ten seconds and i measured what is the maximum that we've the maximum error that we saw before that cutoff, and what is the maximum error that we saw in the 10 or 20 seconds after that cutoff? If those numbers are very similar, then great, we can be reasonably sure that the that this thing is is stable, that we're seeing roughly a periodic type of type of wave. If if they're not, um, and oftentimes they with the with the low KP values. They were not. Um, the second that once we got out here, these were smaller, right? Because this thing got more stable over time. Um, so we saw a significant difference. I finally got to a point where we were seeing very little difference, which was great. And then I can just measure the number of crossovers in the whole experiment time and divide it um, by the total experiment, or take the total experiment time and divide it by the crossovers. And then we get our ultimate period, which is the the additional tuning value. Now, that, of course, doesn't really help us. Now all we have is a big wobbly thing. But the Ziegler-Nichols method gives us a whole set of tuning values that actually lets us convert from those two values into a KP, a KI, and a KD actual tuning values that we're going to use. So I went ahead, I tested a whole bunch of values until I got something that oscillated, it actually didn't take too long because I didn't even I didn't even step at five very much. I went all right. Let's try one. All right. Nope. That good. That gets stable. Let's try two. Nope. That gets stable. Two. Uh, let's try three. Nope. It doesn't. Um, and then eventually we got to a value where it stopped doing that. And I said, all right, that's perfect. Let's go ahead and convert. Let's let's find the values because they're all available as part of a formula. That's wonderful. We can go ahead and they say, hey, if you want to use big control, you have 0.6 of your KU is your KP, and then point blah, blah, of your KI is your K, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Just formulas to calculate all those tuning values. I plugged it in, and uh, this is the result. Let's take a look. So we've pulled the values out of the last test, and now it's just time to see if it works. So I have this very simple tuned hover test. We're waiting until RCS so that I can turn on infinite fuel. We're uh, setting our target thrust-to-weight ratio to zero for now. We're figuring out gravity at our current location by body mu and ship altitude, blah, 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 because that's going to change based on the on the craft we're on. Um, we're going to grab our max thrust-to-weight ratio, um, as calculated by being our max thrust, divided by gravity times our mass. And then we're going to lock throttle to... Um, Target thrust to weight ratio divided by max thrust ratio, but we're also going to ban that at, uh, we're going to cap that at one, obviously, because throttle can't be more than one. Lock steering to up, all this stuff, and then here we have the main loop. So I've got my PID here. Local PID is PID loop, and we've got the KP that is generated, 2.7, a KI of 4.4, and a KD of 0.12, and we're locking it between zero and the max thrust to weight ratio. And I say, all right, we're to start off, just put our set point at zero, and until forever, 
if uh, if I hit the RCS, then go ahead and decrement our set point. If I hit SAS, then go ahead and increment our set point. And I'm just going to update our max output um, over time. This is uh, when when we actually do have fuel loss, then our max thrust to weight ratio is going to change. And so we can go ahead and change that max output. And we'll set the target thrust to weight ratio to pit update, and we'll pass the time seconds and shift vertical speed. And that's all. We're just doing that in a loop. So I can hit SAS or RCS to change our set point. And you can see me messing around with that right now on the other half of the screen. And just just see how well that seems to work. So the whole reason we needed to have a hover script in the first place is that we're planning to land on the moon, which we've done before with an unmanned uh, rocket. Of course, it did a suicide burn and then some, some crazy sort of hovery stuff. But one thing that it didn't do, and it really didn't have the finesse, and the, the good hover skills to do, uh, was actually avoid any terrain issues. We got very lucky that it landed somewhere flat. It just so happened to. If we end up coming down and we realize that we're gonna land on a mountain, we're gonna have some problems. So how are we gonna go ahead and figure out if we're gonna land on a mountain? Because now we have the ability to hover and we'll have to worry about steering while hovering, but how do we detect that there's a problem to begin with? Well, we can get the terrain altitude for a particular latitude and longitude. That's something we get with KOS. We can't get just the slope at a particular latitude and longitude. That doesn't really exist. We're going to have to calculate that ourselves. So really what we want is not, so we, you've got this map, right? It's just out here being whatever it is. And you have some arbitrary point. You know, the, we're, we're up here and down here we know, okay, this is the height. We don't really care about that point. What we really want is a plane, not an airplane. But a flat, like a like a like a plane, like just nah. Imagine this goes out into infinity and cuts off you, I guess. Yes. Now we need to be able to define this plane. Because if we have if we if we know that the plane looks like this and we're coming down like this, we can go, hey, you know what, there's a problem. Not only is there a problem, but also maybe the solution to the problem is to go this way and then try and go down, right? Um, as opposed to just going this way or this way, in which case we don't really expect any sort of improvement. If we expect, if we notice that the ground is tilted like this, it's not going to matter if we move in this direction. We want to move in either this direction or that direction. So how do we define a plane? Well, we can imagine that this card extends out to infinity, up and down and side to side, and forward and backward. I can, uh, so moving it side to side and up and down doesn't matter. It's still part of the same infinite plane. Moving it forward and backward does a little bit. So let's go ahead and imagine, we'll define that there's one particular point where we have to keep this plane. So I'm gonna say, all right, at some point the plane has to intersect with this point, all right? Well, that's fine. I can go ahead, I can have a plane that goes like this. I can have a plane that goes like this. I can go like this. Any, there are, there are an infinite number of planes. I can rotate this all around as long as it just makes contact with that single point. So one point is not enough to define a plane. Let's make a line. I'm gonna grab, there we go. We're gonna define a line, right? So we'll say here. Now I've restricted, so this plane has to intersect with this line. Well, that's fine. There are 360 degrees of rotation under which the plane can intersect with the line. So we still haven't fully restricted it. What we can do is define a plane by two lines. So I have, I have two pens now. I'm just making sure, yeah, there, in camera. Now this thing is not free to rotate because it has to intersect with both of these lines. And what we'll actually do is we'll represent these with vectors. So once we have that, you can actually, because we have these two vectors that are just two lines, and there's only one way to draw a plane that intersects with both of these, you can actually take the cross product of these two vectors and get a third vector that points out from the plane. So what we're looking for is basically the, the thing that will stick out perfectly opposite to wherever the plane is. So if it's angled like this, the, 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 the perpendicular thing is like that. If it's angled like this, it points upward. If it's angled like this, it's sideways. If it's angled like this, it's whatever. And then we can compare that angle to whatever directly up from the center of the, the moon or the or Kerbin or whatever is and say, okay, what is the difference between straight up and this? In this case would be, I guess, what, 45 degrees? About 45 degrees between up and, and where this currently is. So we're gonna go ahead and jump now to my wonderful little testing craft on the launch pad. And we can go ahead and look at latitude and longitudes within a reasonable 
distance from us. So we're going to take three points and we're going to draw lines between um, between one of them and, and the second one and then one of them and the third one. And we'll take the cross product to get what the predicted slope is at the place that we're currently hovering over. So I've got some additional code. First, we have a function geo offset, which takes in a geo position and takes a north offset in meters and an east offset in meters. And uh, I kind of stole this from some code I found on the KOS subreddit. Oh, by the way, go to the KOS subreddit. It's great. It's going to return us another geo position uh, with that same offset, which is basically what we want. So it's taking the latitude from the current geo and then it's adding some, some stuff to us, dividing it by body radius and math. Um, just to, to basically convert it to another latitude and longitude so we can do stuff. Now I've got a function get plane, and this is going to say, all right, um, center is going to be our geo position plus some meter offset. Um, so you will say get plane um, of, on the ground based on some offset relative to our ship. So we pass in an X and a Y. It should, probably should be a Y and an X, but it doesn't really matter. What I'm going to do then is I'm going to generate three spots. I'm going to generate a spot, which is a geo offset center uh, plus five in one direction, B spot, which is negative five and five and negative five and negative five. We'll go ahead and actually see this on the on the launch pad as well. If we look at A vector and B vector and C vector, these are going to be the altitude position at the terrain height of these spots. So this just gives us um, the specific position on the ground, not just relative to whatever our ship's altitude may happen to be. Um, I've got in here, we're doing some, some drawing some vectors. So we're taking these A vectors and I'm just drawing a small little up arrows at all three of those spots, just so we'll be able to see them. And then here's where the magic actually happens. We're going to grab the slope because we're by taking the cross product, as I said, of B vector minus A vector and C vector minus A vector. So we're basically just drawing lines between the V spot and the A spot and the C spot and the A spot on the ground. This will make sense for me when we see it, I hope. And then I went ahead and said, okay, well, let's go ahead and draw that as well. And then we're just printing out the angle between the slope and the up vector. The up vector is really helpful. We get it, it, it for free, and it basically just points straight out from the center of whatever body we're orbiting. Um, now I just have, since I'm running this in a, in a sandbox that we're using for testing, I have, okay, we'll get plane. And then if I hit action group one, then just increment X and then say get plane, but move it a little bit away. So increment it by one and then refresh the, the plane, decrement it and Y and et cetera. So we can go ahead and move this around. Let's go ahead and take a look at it in the game. So this is my little test craft that I use for testing assorted scripts in a, in a sandbox mode. It's got a little cal over here, and then it's just sitting on a probe core. And, of course, it's got infinite power, which is all that I really need. I'm going to go ahead and hit RCS to enable this job, and here we go. Here's exactly what's going on now. You can see it a little bit more clearly. We are taking our current geo position. I'm drawing these, little, these three little triangular spots. And what it is doing is it is drawing vectors between here and between here, and then it's taking the cross product to generate this upward vector. Now, the position is just set relative to our craft, but, uh, or well, it's it's set relative to the, to the center position, um, but it's basing off of these three. And if I start to move this around, so I can increment that X and Y offset by hitting action groups one, two, three, and four, you see, and of course it's gonna rotate, but the rotation we don't really care about. Here's what starts to get interesting. If I go here, now you can see it's thinking, well, yeah, you can see there's a little bit of an angle. Actually, let's pop open the terminal and see what we can see. Now, it's actually printing out the angle um, that it thinks uh, this vector has relative to the horizon. So this now it's uh, 8 degrees. So that is an 8-degree slope that we've got that it's, that it's currently dealing with. If we were to try and land right there, um, if we try and land like here, now all of a sudden we're dealing with 16 degrees. It's a little difficult to see uh, with this vector because um, it's because you're dealing with perspective plus stuff, and it's you know we can't exactly track the vector, um, but there we go. There is there is a terrible angle. That's 25 degrees. And we can go. Yeah, definitely don't try and land there because that would be very 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 bad. Um, let's go ahead and send to this a little bit more. There we go. Let's and now let's see if we can get this. Actually, let's let's be let's be really evil. Um, now it is drawing, so it is tracking. Oh yeah, never mind. That's that's actually perfectly a perfectly fine place to land. Uh, the problem arises if we try and land like over here. 2.54, 8 degrees, 13 degrees, 22 degrees, 25, and all it's doing is it's sampling these ground points in these three positions, and it is basically drawing a plane. If you imagine a triangle that we're drawn between these three, it's drawing uh, a 
and then you were to put the vector sort of balanced on top of that triangle pointing directly out from the face of the triangle, that is what we're looking at. And we can compare that to directly up and go, hey, that's not a good place to land. So this is what we're going to end up doing to detect stuff. Now, you could also expand out um, how far you want these, these measurements to be if we wanted to get a sense of, well, I, I care that in general this is a not a rough terrain but if we expand out too much then we run the risk of yeah there could be a lot of you know crazy spiky stuff in the middle of these three points that we're not accounting for because we're basically treating uh, this is all very very smooth so that is it for today in the next episode we're definitely going to be working on doing some steering so having to worry about hovering but also making some small adjustments to our uh, lateral velocity trying to cancel it out or add it if we discover that we are coming down over a slope and would otherwise try and land sideways because we don't want to land sideways um if we depending on how much progress we make i'm not entirely sure we'll probably also get the suicide burn stuff done though we've done that a couple of times so i think that should go pretty quickly and then we can test out um basically going from a from a from a midair to a, a suicide burn and then to a to a nice slow controlled descent and at that point, I think we're probably ready to send uh, probably an uncrewed, but uh, send, a, send a, a craft out to the moon and just see, see how it does. So I will hope to see you soon. Well, I will hope to see you next week. Be sure to tune in and I will see you then. Cheers. <laughs>